Welcome to Live with Marketers, our award-winning LinkedIn Live broadcast series exploring industry trends and future forward views of the marketing landscape with some of the brightest and best in the B2B arena. My name is Alex Rin. I'm a senior content marketing manager here at LinkedIn, and I'm broadcasting to you today from sunny yet chilly San Francisco. Thank you so much for joining today's episode. We're going to share exclusive data that we've just uncovered on how the pandemic has changed marketing jobs and what this means for you as marketers and what it means for your businesses. So a couple of housekeeping notes before we jump in. We're going to save around 10 minutes at the end for Q&A. So please be sure to submit your questions throughout the broadcast and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. And also, we will have a survey at the end. Please um, fill it out. We'd really appreciate it. Just letting us know how we did. Obviously, we want to be broadcasting topics that are most important to you and your business. So um, love your feedback always. Now, it is my pleasure to welcome today's speakers. We have Connie Chen. She's a senior insights analyst here at LinkedIn. And Takia Burt. She's the editor of the Marketing Solutions blog, also here at LinkedIn. Thank you both so much for being here today. I'm beyond excited to hear about the data that you two have uncovered on new job opportunities in lieu of the pandemic and specifically opportunities for women and minorities. Would love for each of you to introduce yourselves and as is tradition here at LinkedIn, share something that is not on your LinkedIn profile. Thanks, Alex. My name is Connie and I am a senior insights analyst on the marketing solutions team. So my primary job is to partner with our sales and marketing teams by leveraging LinkedIn's vast first party data to inform and consult on a marketing strategy for our largest advertisers. So something that's not on my LinkedIn profile, I'm actually an amateur photographer um, and I particularly like film photography. So I've been using this vintage Minolta camera for a while. And I've taken some of my uh, good friends' engagement and uh, baby photos now. So I'm thinking about starting my own small business one day. Side yep. notes are, all, are always good, Connie. Yep. Uh, my name is Takia Burt, and I am the global editor for the LMS blog. And so any of the content that you see coming out of the blog, I had a hand in. And I hope that you take a moment today to subscribe to the blog. Um, something that's not on my LinkedIn list. So I am a city girl born and raised, and I... Um, have never had the opportunity or much space to have a garden. So when we bought our house five years ago, I became a master gardener. And now I have a garden that takes up our entire yard. And I also have a gardening blog, which you are free to subscribe to at www.takiabert.com. Yeah, and Takia's most recent work was actually featured. Didn't one of your blogs get picked up by a major publication in Chicago? Yes, like something that was really fantastic was I had fans of my blogs at the Chicago Botanic Garden, which is the largest garden in our area. And so they asked me to write a couple of guest posts, which thrilled me to no end. So yes, Amazing. it was very exciting. That's awesome. And Connie, I fully support you going into photography. Connie sent me a, a headshot for this broadcast and it was amazing. So I support both of your endeavors outside of marketing, but today <laughs> we're here to talk about marketing and um, the term disruption when referring to last 15 months or so probably wore its welcome out about 13 months ago, but it's hard to think of a better way to describe the shakeup scene in marketing in marketing jobs during this time, how they performed, um, where they've performed, who they've been performed by, and these changes will certainly ripple forward for years to come. Um, so the goal of this broadcast, we want to talk about the research that Connie and Takia worked on together, and we really just want to ensure that you're in a position to take advantage of the emerging trends that are reshaping marketing as we know it. So we have a lot of content. I'm just going to go ahead and dive into it. So part one of this is how the pandemic has changed marketing jobs overall. First, I wanna ask Connie and Takia, 
Um, why did you conduct this research now and what was the methodology behind it? Well, I can, I can take on um, why we did it. We did it because of exactly what you said, Alex. The pandemic has changed the fabric of not just our personal lives, but also our professional lives. So it's um, accelerated digital transformation for companies, which in turn has, you know, actually uh, changed what the marketing role is. And I think um, as part of this report, we were really interested in figuring out what that meant for marketers today. Yeah, and then for methodology, um, my team looked into all job activity within the marketing function over the last year. And then what we did was we compared the most recent six months to the six months before that to uncover some insights and trends that we could take to marketers on the blog. Perfect. So can you um, can you share before we dive in just some of the main highlights? High level takeaways before we dive into each one individually? Well, the 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 best takeaway from our research is that it's a really great time to be a marketer. The job market for marketers is booming right now. Um, what we're also seeing is because um, remote work has sort of changed how businesses interact with their employees, it's also changed you know, what the marketing role is, sort of as digital transformation has taken place and as um, customers are sort of needing to find a better way to connect with companies. Yeah, and just to add on to that, um, marketing, I think in the past traditional has traditionally has been seen as a cost center. And I think with digital transformation and everything that's gone on in the last year and with adults being online more than ever, there's an increased need to differentiate yourself as a brand. And how do you do that? It's with marketing. And so that's why we're also seeing that big boom in marketing jobs um, and the shift towards uh, marketers having to pick up more digital skills. That is all great to hear for myself and for you guys and for all the marketers on the line. Um, so whoever who was on the broadcast, any of you who were on the broadcast last month, we talked a lot about um, the great resignation, so to speak. So LinkedIn and Microsoft recently under some data that said 41% of employees leaving are gonna leave their employer this year or during the next 12 months. Um, which is actually double the job switching intent that we typically see this time of year. So uh, with that, I want to pull the audience quickly. So I'm kicking this question over to you. The question is, are you planning on moving to a different company or industry in the next 12 months? I'll give you a couple seconds to respond. So A is yes, I've been waiting to make my move. B, no, I still feel fulfilled in my current role or C, maybe if a better opportunity came along. So do we have any predictions to Kia Connie of what you think we'll see? I think we're gonna see a yes. Yes. <laughs> that, would be, that would support the data that we recently found. Yeah. But, but um, who knows? We'll give you a couple more seconds to respond and see what comes in. You know, I'm trying to remember, uh, the, I read a story this morning that actually said that even people satisfied with their jobs, it was a study that came out, are, are leaving. So that's also interesting. Okay. You know what I think it is? Oh, um, no, go ahead, go ahead Tom, Connie. Oh yeah, you know what I think it is, is uh, I think um, people were satisfied maybe with the work-life balance when they were in the office, but now that they're n not in the office, there's more of a blurred line and without those perks that some companies give you, um, they start to really think about whether they want to be there or not. Right. Yeah, I've heard that some folks are would rather quit and find a new job than go back into the office, <laughs> which <laughs> is wild because, like, when you think about all the things we used to do, like get up at X time, get ready, commute for this amount of time, like you right. know. It, now I think about it and I feel exhausted. But anyway, um, so the answer, the the main um, response was yes by 48%. Uh, so we were correct. No, 34%, and then maybe 17%. So yes, most of the people are planning to move for a different to, to a different company or industry. So let's talk about how you can skill up and what type of jobs are available. So overall, from your research, and I'll start with you, Connie, how has the pandemic changed marketing jobs? Yeah, so I think 
to understand how the pandemic has changed marketing jobs, we actually have to look at how the pandemic has changed every single industry. Um, and we alluded it, to it before, but the pandemic actually accelerated digital transformation for every single industry. Um, I saw this McKinsey study that said that the pandemic sped up digital transformation by seven years on average globally uh, within the last year. So that's a massive amount. Um, and because of that, we are seeing an increased demand for online purchasing and services, um, de demand for advanced technologies for decision-making and operations. And um, a lot of companies are migrating their assets to the cloud and companies are concerned about data security as well. And so because of that, companies are investing in these digital solutions to make flexible working as efficient as possible for their workforce. And with the accelerated adoption of these digital solutions, every job function has to pick up more technical skills to adapt to that evolving landscape. And that's no different for marketers. Um, what we alluded to before was that um, within this work from home environment, marketers are obviously using their computers to do their work and their companies are Pick, uh, are uh, adopting these solutions for them to use to make their marketing easier and more efficient. And so they have to quickly learn those skills if they want to stay relevant in the job. Wow, that that is incredible. Seven years. That that all yeah. happened in the span of like 15 months. So that's yeah. pretty wild. That is wild. That's very wild. <laughs> um, Takiya, do you have any just general overall summary of how it's changed marketing jobs? Yeah, um, you really have to be up on your digital skills. And Connie talked about this a little bit before. Um, some of the biggest growth we've seen in job titles were in the digital area. Um, also, as I said previously, the marketing jobs landscape is very, very good for marketers, for both remote and for people who are willing to relocate. Actually, we've seen a lot of relocating to other places. So it's a really exciting time, actually, to be a marketer is what. Yeah this survey has you know the, the state up. of marketing is is looking up it is looking um, up your recent deep dive also uncovered some really unique insights that shine in encouraging um light on marketing growth um so can you share some so marketers are more in demand than ever is basically what i'm gathering do you have specific data points from your study that support that yeah, so um, here's three big ones that we felt really stood out. So we saw 63% growth in marketing jobs in the last six months, which is crazy. Um, 381,000 marketing jobs posted in the last year, and around 17,000 of those were remote. Um, so just, I think, massive growth there. Um, I don't think that this is um, just solely due to the pandemic, but I think, like we'd said before, the pandemic really accelerated this kind of growth. Yeah, and I want to um, add to that, Connie, that um, companies like Catch a Fire have grown their marketing departments the most in the past six months. And the interesting thing about that are the top two in the industry are nonprofits. And I think that sort of ties in a lot to, you know, brand purpose. I think at this point, people are looking for a sense of purpose at their work. And today, actually, our own Alex Wren published a great post on our blog um, that sort of spotlighted some research from Edelman and Porter Novelli that showed that people are prioritizing passion and purpose in the workplace. And two of those figures were 67% of the respondents in the Edelman survey said that having a sense of purpose at work was more important now than it was before the pandemic. And 78% of respondents in the Porto Novelli survey said that they're more likely to want to work for a company that leads with purpose. So I think um, it's interesting that the most growth has been in um, nonprofits. And I think figures like that can tell us why. I think people are looking, the pandemic really forced people to sort of look at, you know, why they're doing what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. I, I completely agree. So purpose, it has taken center stage for companies that we want to work for and companies that we want to buy from. So um, it affects bo both areas. Mm -hmm. what, um, what are some other industries that, that have been high in demand? Yeah, so we saw arts and retail pop um, in our data. And it's interesting because I actually have a friend who works in um, animation at 
um, a big you know meter. And so I, she she's been more busy than ever. And I think it's because um, people have been like on their couches after they work, watching Netflix or watching some of these um, these shows and and for a certain amount of time, uh, actors can actually go in and, and act and, and uh, shoot movies. And so they relied on a lot of the animated shows to keep that industry going. So I feel like that's my, my sort of assumption for why arts is popping. Um, for retail, um, like I said before, there's been an increased demand in purchasing. Um, and so because of that, a lot of retail companies have had, had to shift the way that they sell their products to uh, consumers. And then they've also had to, in addition, differentiate themselves from their competitors. And so because of that, they need um, skilled marketers to come in and define their brand. And so that's uh, our thinking for why arts and retail have been sort of up there in terms of industries. Yeah, retail definitely makes sense. I saw this this meme around like how tracking packages had become the new sports because sports were on hold because of COVID and everyone had just this influx of like Amazon packages and whatnot because we're trying to find something else to fill the void. So anyway, that, that definitely makes sense. In addition to that, oh, sorry, go ahead. I said I feel that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I feel that my bank account definitely felt that. <laughs> um, so in addition to all that remote work, the remote work has been a hot topic. Like I mentioned, people would rather leave their jobs than actually go back into the office. What did you what did you find surrounding remote work? Anything? Yes. Yeah, so remote work has grown exponentially and, you know, has continued to grow over the course of the pandemic. So specific things that we found that 17,000 remote marketing jobs were posted in a year, which is, you know, a lot of jobs posted in one year. Um, and our research is sort of backed up by other research outside um, as well. Uh, research from Global Workplace Analytics estimates that 25 to 30% of the US workforce will be working from home multiple days a week by the end of 2021. And that is a major shift in our workplace, um, in, in, in our workplace history. We've never done such a thing. And because of this, employers are also leveraging more flexible staffing positions. Um, and probably um, most of the positions that they're looking for are gonna be in the digital or media space because 50% of the marketing jobs that were posted on LinkedIn have been in the digital and um, media space. And the other interesting thing that we found is that remote work is not just affecting, you know, people working at home. It's also affecting people, um, you know, marketers that are relocating to different areas like Atlanta and New York to find more opportunity. So um, remote work has really shifted the workplace in the past year. And I and I think that we're going to continue to see more of that um, over the next couple of years. Yeah, it is interesting because I feel like the work from home um, setup was typically reserved for the super affluent mm -hmm. in the past. Um, and now it's just it's a lot more accessible to a broader mm -hmm. range of folks. So it is interesting, the shift. Do we know how 17K in the past in the last year um, stacks up to previous years? I think it's significantly higher. Um, okay but don't have the exact numbers actually, but it is significantly right. higher. Okay, yeah, I mean, it is a lot of, of remote jobs. So it, it, um, I'm sure that it's a big jump. All right, so let's talk about um, the in-demand skills and in-demand jobs. So how can you scale up and what type of jobs are available to marketers now? Um, so I'll start with you, Connie. What are the most in-demand skills and jobs? Yeah, so I can cover off on skills. So. Um, because everyone was forced to work from home um, and because everyone was online more than ever, uh, what we saw was there was an increasing reliance on technology and then there was a growing trend of leveraging social media and a continuing re relevance of SEO um, or search. And so um, I know like I were I was on my phone way more um, during this past year than I ever have been and checking my social media apps way more than I ever have been. And so um, because of that, what we saw pop in our data was that social media and paid search skills are high priority and the most in demand. Um, and I feel like because 
adults are online more than ever and they're using their social media apps more than ever, it increases that importance um, for marketers to reach them where they're at on those channels. Um, another thing that I found really interesting was that creative problem solving and branding skills popped too. Um, and I think that speaks to the digital transformation piece, um, especially with the competition that's kind of rising out of this growing need for digital solutions. There's just a lot more space for different players to come in and create solutions for um, different verticals, um, industries. And so for the people that are already in the space, um, sorry, not people, but companies that are already in the space, um, and for the new companies that are trying to get into those that space, they need to differentiate themselves from their competitors using marketing. And so the marketers are trying to pick up on that um, and trying to cater to that need to drive value for the companies they work for by picking up those creative problem solving skills and those branding skills to um, create that differentiation. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I definitely know that personally, I spent more time on social media. It almost became this like nervous tick of like needing yeah. to check if I had notifications. And so I decided it had become unhealthy. And I went on vacation recently and I just like did not open Instagram for an entire week. And it actually felt really good. It just, it clears up a lot of mind space. But yes, folks are spending a lot more time online. Um, creating creative problems, problem solving totally makes sense. I feel like B2B companies, um, and this actually leads in well to the August Live with Marketers, but B2B companies are really needing to level up their creative and investment in creative, which has typically been more of like a B2C thing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so that that all makes sense to me. To Kia, what about the most in-demand jobs or job titles? Yeah, following up on what Connie said, um, it's no surprise that the most in-demand jobs have the word digital in them. So in our research, we found that the fastest growing occupations were was um, number one, media coordinator, two, search manager, three, social media coordinator. And the most in-demand occupations are digital marketing specialist, digital account executive, and social media manager. And one of the great things I think about um, the LinkedIn platform and something that I certainly take advantage of are um, the LinkedIn learning courses. And I think that, um, you know, there are some ways that we can use these to help marketers sharpen the skills they need for these jobs. Um, I have a list actually. The most popular LinkedIn learning courses for uh, marketers, the first three, um, the six learning habits of high performers, two online marketing foundations, and three unconscious bias. And I think these sort of all speak to the changes that are happening right now um, in our in our country. So the six learning habits of high performer, which if you were interested, are to practice silence for greater greater clarity, make truthful affirmations, use visualizations to motivate yourself, boost your energy with exercise, read, journal, and practice gratitude, right? So I think that points to the fact that wellness is becoming a more, you know, hot topic in our lives as, you know, the pandemic has changed it so much. I think the fact that we're talking, there's a course about unconscious bias, as we can see, is with all of the events that have happened over the past year with, um, gender and race that it's no surprise that that's also um, one of our top courses. The other thing I sort of wanted to point out was the five learning courses that we recommend for the digital marketing skill, because I think that's really important and it can, it can help um, young marketers at least um, beef up their skills. The first one is SEO foundations. Number two is social media marketing foundations. And number three is online marketing foundations. And I think um, those courses give you a great sort of um, base knowledge to start learning the skills that are in high demand at, at these companies that are hiring right now. Yeah, those all sound great. And those can all be found at that that short link um, that was at the bottom of the screen while Takia was talking, which has just appeared magically at the bottom of the screen again right now. Um, those are interesting, the, the top habits of high performers. Do you, either of you engage in either of those? So I recently started trying to do this, but I didn't realize it was actually a LinkedIn learning course. I just Googled it myself. Um, and then I, I 
now I haven't gotten as far as to like journal, but I have tried to wake up earlier and say affirmations and just have some quiet time. <laughs> Yeah, I like that too. I also like setting affirmations and journaling and, and doing all those good things. But yeah, I think availing yourself of the LinkedIn learning courses are a great idea. It allows you to, you know, boost your skills in many different ways and on your own time. So I like I liked personally doing that. Absolutely. Yeah, I um, traditionally have not been very good at journaling because I don't know where to begin. So... <laughs> I got the five yeah. minute journal. Oh. I'm, this is not a sponsored ad. I do not have a partnership with them, but um, but I saw a lot of celebrities using it. And long story short, it's just like a really good way to to practice gratitude and mindfulness throughout the day. So How long have you been doing it, Alex. Um, I did it like straight for like two weeks, and then I got busy and forgot about it as usual. But then I. <laughs> picked it up again and I do it more of like sporadically now, but um, I try and put it like right on my nightstand. So I remember to do it when I wake up and when I go to bed, but awesome. it's good to look back on. Cause then you, you see like accumulation of this could be its own broadcast anyway. So let's go back <laughs> to the topic at hand here. Takia, you got me, you got me off track. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so uh, we talked a little bit about accessibility now and geography. So geography is definitely lessening in importance um, as work from home is accelerated and folks realize that they can pull from a larger um, pool of, um, of candidates rather than just focusing on the people that are actually in the city that the company is in. And as LinkedIn news editor Ashley Peterson recently highlighted, remote job listings have skyrocketed across the professional spectrum over the last year, as we've talked about before. Specifically, as of May 20th, the percentage of paid job postings on LinkedIn that offered remote work had risen by 457% compared to one year earlier. Um, such jobs aren't just becoming a lot more common. They also are about two times as popular as conventional listing in terms of how many people apply. So clearly in demand, which brings me to my second poll for the audience. Poll number two is how important is a flexible work setup? A, very important. B, pretty indifferent about it. C, not important at all. I know some folks actually are anxious to get back into the office because there's less distractions and no kids and no dog and et cetera. So interesting to see what folks say. What do you guys think? Do you have any predictions? A, very important. Yeah, yeah based on the research, I'd say, but you know. No. Yeah. yeah, I think A too. I think the option of having a work set up at home is, is key. Yeah, and I do. And I think now that people realize they can be productive at home and work from home, you know, that's also affected, you know, how they view their workday and how flexible they want it to be. And I think that's a lot of what's driving these changes as well. Yeah, the flexibility that I have now is just um, something that I thought only was reserved for people that were like, just way farther along in their career. Um, so I, I don't know, it's going to be back. What's that? They don't want to go back. They don't want to go back, but like, if you're like us and you're very spoiled, you have a gym and food. So there are certain things, and just like general human interaction, like I yeah. guess that's kind of important as well. Yeah. Um, all right, so we have the results are in 92%, very important, 92. Four indifferent, 4%, 4 not very important. So yes, very. it's a very important perk. Right. Um, so let's talk about it. Tia, how has the pandemic created new career opportunities for marketers? So there's more flexibility for more flexibility, and there are new cities that marketers can go to um, for career growth. So I think that um, first, let me talk about the top 10 growing remote jobs for marketers, which I think is interesting because I am also an editor and a writer. But digital marketing specialist, copywriter, and digital marketing manager um, are the top 10 growing remote jobs for marketers. And I think that as a writer, seeing copywriter in the top three is great. And if you look further, further down the list, you'll also see content writer as one of the roles that um, people are hiring most for. And meanwhile, to sort of boost their careers, marketers have also started to relocate to cities like New York and Los Angeles. And opportunity also sort of exists in places like 
San Francisco and Chicago. The most interesting thing to me are the statistics that we found around salary. So if you're a marketer with not a lot of experience and you're first starting out your career, you might want to avoid trying to land a job in a place like New York City. Um, the highest page in region we actually found was in Charleston, South Carolina, with a median salary of $87,700. Um, the next, the next play, the next highest salary was in the San Francisco Bay Area, and that's eighty-seven thousand two hundred dollars. And I'll point out this is all just for North America. And the third was in Toronto, um, Canada, eighty-six thousand seven hundred dollars. The lowest page is paying region, so you definitely want to stay away from these places. <laughs> Love <Lubbock, laughs> <Texas. laughs> with a median salary of thirty-three thousand dollars a year. Sorry, what was that one? Lubbock, Texas. $33,000 Baton Rouge, Louisiana, $33,200 a year. And Las Cruces, New Mexico at $32,600 a year. Now for those marketers who have more than two years of experience or are more seasoned, um, cities, you're, you're more likely to get paid a bigger salary in cities. Um, the highest page in re region for experienced marketers, marketers are, is San Francisco Bay Area at $92,600 the greater Seattle area at $91,200 and the Pittsfield, Massachusetts area, which kind of surprised me, <laughs> at $86,000. Um, um, yeah, the lowest pay paying regions were San Angelo, Texas at $36,500, Jacksonville, North Carolina at $34,600 and Hattiesburg, Mississippi, $34,100. Um, so the moral of this story is you're most likely to get the salary that you want if you have experience in the city and maybe you want to look outside in a different area if you don't have as much experience if earning a high salary is important to you. I mean, yeah, yeah San Francisco is the second highest um, paid level, but you also have to, you know, think about cost of living and things like that. So there's exactly what I was going to say is that yeah. the city, you make more money in the city, but you also pay more for rent in the city. So if you really want to make money, you should get a job at a, at a company that's in San Francisco, but live in <laughs> right. Montana in a field. <laughs> have a really good job and, and, you know, have the company be based in San Francisco. So yes, that's a great idea, Alex. Yeah. Uh, so I noticed when you were listing off the top uh, job titles for remote workers that a lot of, most of them were entry level, mm -hmm. um, or at least it sounded like it, like specialist, typically when you see specialist, it, it means more entry level. So do we, do we know why we think that is? Yeah, um, so our, our assumption here, um, and also being marketers and having worked in those roles too, is that when you're entry level or you're more of an individual contributor, you're a lot more tactical. So you're on the ground, using the tools, um, learning the skills, um, executing on everything that needs to be done to get the brand out, to get the brand out there, to get the assets out there, to um, to run a campaign. But when you're at a higher level, um, sorry, to back up there, um, because of that, those roles can be done from anywhere because all you really need is a computer. And I think companies are starting to recognize that um, as long as someone has the skills for the job, they can execute on those campaigns that they need to send out um, from anywhere in the world or in the country. But for um, someone who's higher up, like probably like a director plus or even at the VP um, C-suite level, you probably um, are not doing a lot of that execution tactical work, but you're really up there um, connecting with people in the industry, um, starting to have big conversations and strategic um, meetings about where you want the brand to go. And a lot of times that involves having those conversations with people who are at about the same level as you. And so there's a lot more um, of connection going on there. And that probably needs to be done more like in an actual office or done at least in the same location so that the time zones work out. And so um, that's sort of our assumption for why we think that uh, these IC level roles are probably much easier to be remote than maybe like a CMO level. Interesting. Just 
for everyone online if, if um, IC means an individual contributor. Um, but yeah, that definitely that definitely makes sense. So people want remote, but um, general uh, in-person human connection and relationship building is still very important too. So it's all about balance. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of moving around. What does this mean for brands, Connie? Yeah, so I think the biggest thing that brands need to take away from this is that you need to be flexible because digital transformation is real. It's not stopping. So it's something that all brands are going to have to get on board with. Um, for what, what you said before, marketing marketers are actually quitting their jobs rather than going back to the office. So in order to keep the top talent, you're going to have to adapt to the current times. So because of that, um, you have to make sure that you're offering these remote work uh, so kind of uh, environments for your your uh, your workforce to work in. And so they can kind of handle their personal lives while also providing value for the company. And then um, another thing to think about is employer brand. Um, we, we do a little bit of this at LinkedIn too for our advertisers, um, making sure that your uh, potential uh, candidate pool understands the, the offerings that you have for flexible work so that they're more likely if they are someone who um, wants to work in that kind of environment, they are likely to want to work for your company. Um, and we say all that because resignations are up and brands need to stay competitive. Yeah, that, that all makes sense. The name of the game is flexibility. Yeah. All right, so I wanna make sure we leave enough time to talk about women and minorities. So um, your research actually showed that while women have made great advancements in marketing, it's only open to a certain subset of women. So I wanna ask from the research, and I'll start with you, Takia, how are women advancing in the new world of work and what strides still need to be made? Well, the good news is, is that we're seeing um, more women than ever in both managerial and in the CMO role. The only problem is that there isn't much racial diversity. So we looked at, and in addition to our research, we referenced um, research from the ANA, and they found that 52% of CMOs are women, which is up 47% from two, 2019. But on the flip side of that, only 13% of all CMOs have a racially diverse background, and that includes Asian, Latina, and Black women. So, you know, marketing, if you're a woman in marketing, now is a great time to be a woman in marketing, but there's still a lot of work to be done when it comes to um, racial, racial and ethnic diversity. And in particular, um, Black women are very underrepresented um, in executive leadership roles because of 100 men that advance to a managerial role, 58 black women advance compared to 80% white women and 72% overall. So we still have a ton of work to do in that area. Yeah, and I just wanted to um, uh, share an important caveat that gender, we, gender I didn't, I didn't identity isn't binary and we recognize that some LinkedIn members identify beyond the traditional gender constructs or male or female. However, um, LinkedIn gender data is inferred on the basis of first name and pronouns both used and implied and uh, currently does not account for other gender identities. But as members begin to self-report on gender, we will be able to share more inclusive gender data. So just thanks for that important caveat, Alex. You're welcome. That's why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> um, Connie, anything to add to that about females in marketing? Yeah, um, I think in addition, what we saw in the data was that we saw strong female representation in almost every single industry. Um, what's interesting, we saw real estate and wellness and fitness um, be the strongest. So um, I think maybe that might have to do with all the the people buying houses um, in the pandemic and then also you know having to stream their workouts online um, and having to have uh, marketers to promote some of that kind of new content um, on the internet so um, that's sort of my my thoughts there um, another thing we saw was that we saw more women in managerial roles in marketing th than compared to the namer average um, 
Yeah, so if we see here, you know, 53% of uh, women were director plus in marketing. Um, but the thing is, um, this actually was is lower than if you look at it from the individual contributor level, which was around 60-ish percent. Um, so we're still seeing a decrease in uh, gender gender balance when we go up the chain in terms of seniority. So I think there is some work to be done there as well. Um, I also saw that women actually gravitate towards um, social media and brand management in terms of their jobs. Uh, I thought that was really interesting too. Um, the job titles that popped out for women were social media manager and brand manager. Um, and for skills for women, actually, we're seeing that management skills are in the greatest demand. So I think uh, with the, ge the gender diversity split uh, for director plus being uh, closer to a 50-50 split, I think there is a demand and an appetite for more women to get promoted up into management. Um, so I think just for the, the women uh, who are watching, who are marketers, that is one thing that you can start to up level on and start to find opportunities within your current role to manage so that um, we can kind of help this this number overall. Yep, that all that all sounds, sounds wonderful. So the outlook looks good for women. Um, Dakia, does this look the same across the board for all women? Um, or does it vary? Well, one interesting thing, you know, that we found in the research is despite the fact that women are sort of blowing up at work, we're still 18% less likely than men to apply to senior roles or into roles that we're qualified qualified for. And when women do apply, they're 19% more likely to apply to jobs of equal seniority and 8% more likely to apply to jobs of higher sen seniority. So even despite the fact that we're doing well, we still don't um, have that same confidence. Why do you think that is? Well, I think we can look at a lot of things. And I think imposter syndrome is one. Um, there was a study that I just found that was released last October by KPMG that said that a majority of executives, these aren't, th these are executives across a range of industries, 75% of them identified having experienced feelings of inadequacy and self-doubt or imposter syndrome at certain points in their career. And they also say that they think that most women in corporate America experiences this. So we still have sort of a lot of work to do, women, when it comes to sort of having confidence in our own skills and not underestimating ourselves. And imposter syndrome, is that just feeling like, um, like you don't deserve what you have or that you're not like smart enough to- Yeah, that you're hiding in plain sight, right? That you don't yeah. know what you're doing and that you're just pretending is what okay. imposter syndrome is. And I think okay. women are much more likely to um, suffer from it, you know, for many reasons. You guys want to know something that's not on my LinkedIn profile? What? I used to pretend to play the flute like I was on, I was on the band and I played the flute because it was the, what all the girls were doing. And I didn't actually know how to play the flute and I wasn't good at it. So I would pretend to move my hands during the, so. <laughs> yeah. See, even that mimic smart woman like you, Alex. I was, I, I was hiding in plain sight. I'm Imposter you. syndrome. Yeah. Um, okay, so, so why does this, why does, this all matter. What does diversity mean for business? What's the importance? Well, for the most part, it means that diversity is good for business. One of the things that um, we all know is that when you hire more women and when you hire more uh, people of color, you'll have better results. And one study that we looked at from McKinsey showed this. Um, it showed that 25% um, of company of uh, it showed an outperformance by gender by 25% and an outperformance of profitability by ethnic diversity by 36%. So I think this is really important for us to remember. You aren't increasing diversity, gender diversity or racial diversity at your company 
because it's altruistic and you know you you, you want to feel good about it. You do it because it's good for business. When you have more women working at your companies, and when you have more people of color working at your com companies, you make more profits. Yeah, and to add to that, I think it's because we, uh, when you're coming from a different background as someone else, you bring a diverse perspective. And that diverse perspective is good for business because you're you're able to brainstorm on innovative ideas that you might actually turn into products and solutions that you'll bring to your customers to solve mm -hmm. specific customer challenges that maybe another company has not thought of. Right. Um, so I think it, there's a lot of really big positives here. Um, and I think a lot of companies do know this already. So I think it's just now, how do we how do we execute on this and actually um, foster that diverse and inclusive environment so that diverse talent will want to work there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I am also just thinking back to like what we were saying around like what can you know what can women do to to appear to to be more respected in the workplace. And I don't think it's necessarily like us needing to change. I mean, maybe there's some education that needs to be done, but I also think that just like companies need to change their view on women and hiring women in more senior positions. So um, we're great. We're not going to change. No, um, but just, just a thought that I had. No, yeah, for sure. I mean, I love bringing up this stat. It's my favorite stat that black women are the most educated demographic in the country and yet the most underrepresented in leadership positions not just in marketing but across industries and what does that tell you it tell it, it means that it's not black women it's not that they're on you know don't have enough skills or are unqualified it's just that companies need to prioritize making first making their companies more inclusive for people of color so that when they do hire them they'll stay so I think that, you know, companies need to step up to the plate, you know, and do more to make their companies attractive in the first place, right, to women and to people of color and to make sure they get the give support to people once they're in the organization. Yep. That's a great point. Completely agree. Um, so let's wrap up with some takeaways and then we're going to move into Q&A. So um, what do you think are the most impactful takeaways that marketers uh, can and should walk away from this broadcast with? Yeah, so I think the first one we touched on a lot is that digital and social media skills are more in demand than ever. So just um, knowing that finding courses or taking um, online, uh, looking at online videos on how to upskill there, I think will make you incredibly attractive to companies that are hiring marketers right now. Um, another thing that's like related to that is that understanding consumer needs can actually help the brand that you work for differentiate themselves from others. Um, now in this current landscape, uh, there's such a need for targeted marketing instead of just like um, overall sort of uh, bucket, uh, all in, all inclusive, just brand marketing. Um, and consumers are looking for things that actually are addressing the challenges that they're facing. And so if you are a marketer and you understand that and you're able to bring that to your company and execute on a campaign or even on um, a piece of content that speaks to that so that you can generate more, uh, a, a larger customer base for your brand and uh, more customers. I think that would make you incredibly valuable to your current um, your employer or your future employer. And then lastly, um, what we talked about with diversity, um, the work of creating diverse and inclusive work environments, that starts with every single individual. Um, Yes, it is uh, something that companies do need to work on to create those environments where people of color want to stay or women want to stay and work there in addition to attracting them. But also understanding that the people who are working for you already, who are um, who fall into those buckets, they also want to be heard and they want to be promoted and they want to do good work as well. And so understanding um, that it is on you in any position that you're in, whether you're an individual contributor or a manager, to um, check your unconscious biases by 
either taking a class, talking to coworkers, um, just going out there and educating yourself so that you can bring that back into your workplace and help foster a better environment for your team. Perfect. I think those are those are perfectly concise and compact takeaways. I'm going to go ahead and segue into Q&A now. But before we do, um, I'm going to set our survey live um, so that everyone has an opportunity if you have to hop off early or whenever you do have to, to leave us to, to fill the survey, let us know what we did. And again, just um, sharing any future topics that would be that you want to hear about that are most important for your business. Okay, so Q and A. All right, how can I prepare for a change in marketing role? For example, this person particularly wants to go from content to product. Yeah, I can take this one because I actually most uh, very recently did this. Um, so the way that I looked at it was. <laughs> I took, I took a look at my current role and I thought, okay, what are the things about my current role that I really enjoy doing? Um, and what are the things that I think that I'm really good at? And then what are the things that I maybe do not want to carry into my next role? Um, and then I focused on the things that I'm really good at. And then I looked at the role that I wanted and looked at those, the gap with between the things that I'm good at and what that role needs in order for that person to be successful in the role. And then I found those particular skills and then um, turned to my manager and asked him, are there any opportunities within my current role to get projects or be placed um, in cross-functional tiger teams that will get me that kind of experience without act me actually having to leave this role right now? Um, and if you're able to have that candid conversation with your manager about your career goals and what kind of skills you wanna pick up, hopefully your manager will be able to clear blockers for you and be able to put you on projects that'll um, help you get those skills so that you don't have to um, apply sort of blind uh, when you're we're trying to jump functions. Yeah, um, Connie crushing it with the answer. I love that response. <laughs> and you're right, any good manager will help you try and figure out like what you can do within your current role or or help you find a role that kind of like it's like the three circles I've heard before of like what you're good at what you enjoy and what your interests are and like the convergence of that is like should be the most fulfilling role for you yeah definitely um which marketing roles have the highest salary it's not all about the money guys <laughs> so <laughs> Um, a little caveat about salary data on LinkedIn. So it is user um, user inputted. So we only have as much as people are willing to tell us. And then on top of that, because of our data privacy regu regulations, we're only able to look at salary at a very aggregated level. So um, only at a regional level. So I unfortunately cannot tell you which roles are paying the most. <laughs> but I would... Uh, dare to assume that it's CEO, CMO, CCO, <laughs> right? Senior CD leader, director, director. anything C suite director plus, probably, right. probably highest effort, highest salary. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, do you have any marketing books you can recommend? I'm assuming to upskill with. Great question, Alex. We actually on our blog that you can subscribe to. Um, we have a series that we that we call Marketing Books Worth a Look. And the last marketing book worth a look that we ran was by a phenomenal woman named Carla Johnson called Rethink Innovation, How the World's Most Prolific Innovators Come Up with Great Ideas That Deliver Extraordinary Outcomes. So if you want to learn how to think innovatively, and not just think innovatively, but think innovatively, innovatively in a way that drives results, Carla Johnson's book is a great one to pick up. And please do look for the series on our blog because there's a lot of great books that we highlight um, each month. So subscribe now. <laughs> yeah, those actually, those tend to be, um, and Taki can tell you that as well, they tend to be some of our highest performing blog posts. Yeah, marketers love, love to read and people do. And even though we're not in school anymore, we want summer reading lists and fall mm -hmm. reading lists. Some of us, some of us not. Yeah, we love picking up a book. Yes, I prefer, I personally like, I love reading, but I rarely read books about marketing, which is probably TMI, but I like to escape and get into other stories. <laughs> just just being honest, just keeping it real. 
Um, <laughs> okay, so what's the best advice for marketers just starting out? I'm sorry. Um, I think the first, the best advice for marketers starting out is to sort of do a skill self assessment um, and figure out by looking at our research, you know, where you're lacking. And one of the things I mentioned before that I think is really great about LinkedIn is we have all sorts of courses that you can use to upskill and they're all digital courses, which, which is great. So I think young marketers have so much information at their fingertips to sort of upskill and sort of be able to get themselves noticed. Yeah, I think to add on to that, um, because I had sort of a crisis too when I started in this industry, um, I think making sure that you're picking up any kind of experience with all different types of um, marketing teams. Um, you may have been hired onto a specific, specific marketing team. Like for example, let's say you got hired onto the social media team, but that doesn't mean that you can't connect with the brand team or the PR team or the blog team. The, you know, so I feel like um, really putting yourself out there, making those connections early, um, and then even trying to shadow these people on um, their jobs and understanding what the core role of their what the core function of their role is, so that in the future you can you can make an informed decision about what direction you want to take your career in. Because there's just so many different aspects of marketing, and as some when I was someone that was starting out in my career, I had no idea. I honestly just fell into a role um, and I didn't think to explore. And so I've had to do that exploration later on in my career where um, I had much more responsibility at my job than I did earlier in my career. So um, my biggest piece of advice is explore early and make those connections. Um, and people are always willing to talk. Um, okay. And I think they're always willing to educate the next generation because ultimately it leads to value for the company. So. Yeah, to add on to what Connie is saying, just personally, having mentors has been the best thing that has ever happened to me, not only for, you know, job recommendations and things like that, but for moral support, you know, somebody that's in your corner rooting for you um, is really, really important and someone that can point you in the right directions or, or maybe tell you that, may, hey, maybe you are doing the right things and maybe you ought to be doing something else. So I think having someone in a, in a more senior position than you um, is great. And I would also encourage people who are in senior positions to actively try to mentor people because um, we got to pull each other up, right? So yes. I, yeah, so I think the best thing we can do is to, you know, hold out our hands to people and who are younger than us or, or who are earlier in their careers and help them up the ladder with us. Yeah, Absolutely. I actually think that's really important, particularly for women and women of color too, mm -hmm. um, to help check our imposter syndrome a little bit. Right. When you have someone who's a mentor, who's gonna be in your corner rooting for you, um, particularly would be helpful too if they are within your org as well. Mm -hmm. So they can help highlight the good work that you've done or help boost you up when you need a little boost of confidence in a meeting or um, understand you know, where you might be a little less confident in and then help you grow that confidence by suggesting ways that they've addressed it in the past. Um, I think that helps with creating that diverse and inclusive environment too. Yeah, it looks like it sounds like there's a lot here. Maybe we should do an episode on marketing mentorship. Yeah. Might, be <laughs> might be a fun one. All right. So we're, we're almost at the end of the time allotted. So I need to wrap up. We've discussed skills needed in the changing marketing landscape. So I do have to do a very quick plug. This is breaking news for LinkedIn Marketing Solutions. We've just launched our free LinkedIn Marketing Lab certifications. And these are certifications that allow you to stand out from other marketers as a LinkedIn marketing expert, boosting your digital marketing credibility. Like I said, they're completely free. There's practice tests. There's different levels of accredited accreditation. God, that word is, is difficult. Accreditation. <laughs> Um, so go ahead and get started today. I've already, I actually had, um, the chance to help build the course on, on brand awareness. So I, I know firsthand, um, how amazing the courses are and how easy they are, um, to, to take, how accessible. And 
that is all the time we have for today. Thank you so much to our audience for tuning in and being so engaging throughout the broadcast. We really appreciate it. And I hope that you learn something to take back to your team today. Um, quick mention, the next broadcast is around B2B creativity, as I mentioned previously. So it's it's entitled Champions of B2B Creativity. It's happening August 26th at 11 a.m. Pacific time. And um, last but not least, thank you to our speakers. Thank you so much for being here, Connie and Takiya, and for sharing all your great work. It was super fun. Yeah, I had a lot of fun. Yeah. Thanks for inviting us, Alex. Of course, I'll also be sending up a follow-up email to everyone who attended with the recording. So in case you um, couldn't attend today or if you had to hop off during a specific part of the conversation, we'll be sending that out. So that's all with the time we have for today. Thank you, everybody, and see you next month.